Hello everybody, my name is Janet Pugh. I'm sitting here in North Devon and I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my novel about North Devon, Barefoot on the Cobbles. It's not a plot driven novel, it's very much about the people, the people and why they behave as they do. And it's very much also about the location in which it's set. And those of you who know North Devon may guess from the title Barefoot on the Cobbles that it is a novel that is set in Clavelli. And often people ask me, well, what it's about? What's it about? What type of novel is it? What genre? And it's actually not a straightforward question. I usually say it's a historical novel because it is. It's set in a, what I hope is a very well-researched past. And it's about real people, people who actually existed. But it isn't just a historical novel. It's not really a romance. There are relationships in it, but I wouldn't call it a romance. And there's a crime in it. In fact, it starts in a court um, when somebody's on trial, on trial, in fact, for, for manslaughter. But you know who that is from the beginning because that's where the novel starts. I really think it's more of a why done it than a who done it because it's about how those women, or how that woman and her husband, ended up in the courtroom on that day in 1919. And then the novel goes back to 1890 for the build up and all the different pressures that came to play on those particular people, which meant they were on trial for the manslaughter of their daughter. So Clavelli then, obviously a cobbled street, an iconic North Devon fishing village. And there we meet Daisy. Daisy is one of the main characters in the novel. Uh, she is the one who actually dies in, in 1919. That's not a plot spoiler, that's quite clear. So Daisy was a child of the season, delighting in the heat and the chance to discard her boots in favour of skipping over the cobbles in her bare feet. She loved the feel of the hard stones as she curled her toes round each pebble, like a bird poised for flight. Then she would take off down the hill, her bonnet bobbing on her shoulders as it slipped back from her head. There's a lot of quite dark elements to the book. It's, as I say, it's a true story. So the plot told itself, really. And we do have amongst the fishing village and the fishermen and their wives and the people up at the manor house, we do have incidents which take place, for example, in the asylum at Exminster. And here's just a short extract from that particular part of the book. In the shadow of the asylum wall, a diminutive figure crept across the moonlit grass, searching for the sea. She looked much older than her years. She was not yet 60, but her face was heavily lined and a slight shadow of a beard graced her chin. She pushed back the sleeve of her nightgown and dug her dirty fingernails into her arm until the blood ran. She was oblivious to the pain, but she let out an expletive as the blood dripped onto the shapeless garment that flapped round her skinny legs in the sharp December breeze. The woman lifted her head and sniffed like an animal. It was all so unfamiliar. Everything felt wrong. She needed to find the water. Where was the water? Surely she only had to look out of her window and there would be the waves breaking over the gore. It hadn't been easy getting out into the grounds. She wasn't sure why there were so many others out there. She hadn't shared a room since she and Ellen and Lizzie were girls, but despite all the people, it had been possible to slip out once snores surrounded her. The woman had wandered the darkened corridors aimlessly, spurning the chapel which had made, it made her uncomfortable now. She had no place in heaven. God had abandoned her. The steamy laundry was more comforting with its stench of damp linen. She didn't know what had made her try the door to the drying yard, nor what had tempted her outside when it opened to her touch. All she knew was that at all costs she had to get away from those who were hunting her down. The sea would be her salvation. Hamar and Di used to protect her. They were gone now, of course, she knew that. But where was Agnes? It seems such a very long time since she'd seen her older sister. Agnes should be here. They needed to lay the table for the visitors. If she could just climb that fence, she'd get to the sea. She knew she would. She and the frost clung to the icy railings. The wiry little woman dragged a broken laundry hamper across to the perimeter fence. She sucked in her lips over her gums as she looked up at the looming barrier. 
The voices were telling her that she had to climb. She stood on the hamper and prepared to leap upwards. Her voluminous nightgown caught firmly on the spike of the rusting railings. The linen was coarse, but it was thick. It did not tear. She hung suspended in the December darkness, still yearning for the sea that she believed would save her. Madness had claimed another victim. Now, because these are real people, and actually I'm a historian as much as a novelist, I was able to do quite a bit of research into these characters. And that story, as it's told there, apart from how she got out of the asylum into the grounds, and I don't know how that happened, that is all based on asylum records and newspaper reports of the incident. Now, of course, because a large part of the novel is set in Clavelli, it's very much about a fishing community and how the sea impacts on people's lives. And there was an incident in Clavelli at the time the book is set where two men who've just come back from the First World War take a boat out to sea. And it doesn't go well, I think it's safe to say. So this is just an extract from that part of the book. The wave of anticipation rolled from the end of the harbour wall to the quayside and on to envelop those who had decided that the lookout high on the cliff was the better vantage point. Cottage doors opened, shawls were donned and the waiting crowd swelled. Whispered conversations started up, half smiles were exchanged. There was a communal stiffening of shoulders as the villagers braced themselves for the lifeboat's return. Hopes were raised as the Eleanor Roger entered the harbour. But as the crew became distinguishable, the gloomy countenances and hunched shoulders of the weary men told their own story. An unearthly wail, scarcely human, went up from Rose Harding as her father and brothers climbed out of the boat. Normally they wouldn't all be part of the same lifeboat crew. The village liked to spread its risk and its grief, but this had been different. Captain Jen enveloped his sister in his arms and lowered his face to her hair to hide his despair. Go back, Jim, sobbed Rose to her brother. You must go back. I can't do without Will. He must be out there somewhere. Her plea was taken up by others on the quayside. We still have light for another hour. We must go back out. We can't give up. The unspoken thought that it could be them, their husband, their son, added vehemence to their entreaties. Tom Pengilly turned ruefully to his exhausted crew and shrugged his shoulders. The older men were clearly past setting out to sea again. Albert was in his fifties and Captain Jen's father older still. With no sign of the Annie Salome or the two men, Tom had made the common sense decision to return to land. To his mind, he'd already put the lives of his crew in more danger than was wise, spurred on by the thought that they sought brothers-in-law and friends. The weather was dirty and the sea looming. Deep down, Tom knew there was little chance of finding Frank or Will alive. Now, part of my technique, really, when I'm trying to write a novel is to immerse myself, not just in the people, but in the landscape in which they inhabit. And I had a little difficulty with one section of the book because this book spans 1819 to 1919. You cannot ignore the First World War. And I knew I had to incorporate a character who served in the war uh, on the Western Front. Now, I'm not male, I'm no longer young, I've never been anywhere near a battle zone, I haven't even visited the Western Front as a tourist. So I was prepared for this to be a really difficult part of the book for me to write. However, I relied on war diaries, I relied on personal reminiscences, and I put together a story of a young man from Clumber Valley, a real young man, who was part of a little known battle called the Battle of Fromel. It's quite a well-known battle in Australia because the Anzac forces suffered particularly badly at it. But we don't hear of that as we hear of the Somme or Ypres or something like that. So there he is um, in the book. He's called Abraham. That actually wasn't his real name. The problem with writing a book about real people is that you end up with far too many called William or Elizabeth um, or Anne, and so some of them had to have their names changed a little bit. So in the book he's called Abraham, and this is the extract from the Battle of Fromel. Across the plain where the purple clover once bloomed and the swallows used to dive, 
men prepared for death in a blood-stained ditch. The lurking mist that accompanied the persistent drizzle obscured the view, but the deathly crumps of falling shells resounded as the wire-cutting party was sent into the abyss. From the vantage point of the high ground, the Germans were set to defend the salient without thought for the cost in human pain. Abraham knew that he needed to be an example to his men, to ignore his own quickening pulse and hammering heart. He'd been indoctrinated by his schoolmasters to play up and play the game, to do his bit for king and country. Patriotic fervour soon lost its luster in the realities of the Western Front. Abraham remembered the excitement as the recruiting posters were pasted on town hall walls. No one then regarded Kitchener's accusatory finger as the harbinger of death. As the playing fields of England at once echoed with the crowds cheering a winning try, now, the battlefields resounded with the shrieks of the horses and the cries of damaged men. Abraham had grown up with the gentle shires who pulled the ploughs on neighbouring farms. The Clavelli donkeys were known to him by name. Here, the screaming suffering of the terrified horses and the mules was a descant to the appalling symphony that assailed him. Desperate men tried to tear themselves from menacing wire. Others struggled to keep their footing as they fought their way through the chest-high water of the ditches that had failed to drain. The swirling water dyed crimson by their comrades' blood. Now I've read two quite depressing, three to quite depressing pieces from the book really, and I don't really think it, it's all like that. It's about real life, so things don't always go wonderfully well. But we follow Daisy as she leaves Clavelli after an incident with the suffragettes while she's there and she goes to work in Torquay. So two of the longest chapters in the book are actually set in Torquay and I visited Torquay and happened to choose a very very cold spell in January to try and walk in Daisy's footsteps. She makes friends there, she goes to the cinema, um, that was a, a bit of an exercise in itself. I immediately researched the films that would have been available and the summer of 1918, which is when she was going to the cinema with her friend Winnie. And I discovered that the, the first Tarzan film had just been released, and I thought, that's country, I didn't go and watch Tarzan. And then I discovered it actually took 18 months to reach the UK from the United States, so that was out the window. Uh, in the end, they watched Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, and I watched it too uh, on, on YouTube, so I could see what was, was going on. And then I thought, well, there needs to be a, a B movie. In those days, you always had the main feature and then the B movie. So we found a Charlie Chaplin film that suited and that went in. And then of course there was the newsreel and that was a big part of the cinema pre-television and radio days. That was how you got to news often. And I looked up um, what newsreels were showing at the time. And eerily, the current newsreel was about the heir of Cavelli Court getting married. And so it was a hairs standing up on the back of the neck moment when I discovered that that was actually the link and I suspect people who read the book and don't hear me talk about it think I made that bit up but I really didn't have to and, and that's what happened and then while she's in Torquay Daisy contracts the Spanish flu and she's taken back to Clavelli where her parents attempt and fail to nurse her back to health and the book ends where it starts back in the courtroom for the verdict and I'm obviously not going to tell you what that is um, you have to read the book for yourself and you can't even peek to the back and just read the end because that might tell you what the verdict is but the whole point of the, of the book is to, for you to decide whether or not that verdict was a just one so if you want a fairly gritty I suppose is the word historical novel based on fact set in North Devon predominantly there it is and I hope you enjoy it Thank you very much.